this lecture series for Introduction to Philosophy. In this video we continue our discussion of the problem of evil and we will do so by looking at some responses to the argument for evil that we looked at in a previous video. Now you'll recall that the purpose of the argument from evil was to show that given the amount and nature and extent of evil that we find in our world, it is at least unlikely that a perfect God exists. Namely, it's unlikely that an omnipotent, omniscient, and all good being exists given the amount of suffering and horrible tragedy that we see. That's the conclusion arrived at uh, uh, through the argument from evil. Now, of course, the foundation of that argument, and specifically the foundation of its first premise, the premise namely that there are gratuitous or pointless evils, the reason given for why that is true, I said, is encapsulated in what we'll call Rowe's inference. You'll remember that William Rowe was the person who outlined that argument in his well-known article, um, The Problem of Evil and Some Varieties of Atheism. So what is this inference which um, purports to show that there are gratuitous or pointless evils in the world? Well, this is the inference. So first, you have this claim which we'll call P, that we cannot see any reason an omnipotent, omniscient, and holy good being would have for permitting great evil. So the idea is that if you look around, if you think to the best of your ability, if you try to come up with, this, with any reason you can for why a perfect being would allow horrible suffering and tragedy to occur, then Roe thinks we are not able to think of any good reasons. And because we are not able to come up with any good reasons that God would have for permitting horrible tragedies, therefore we can safely conclude that there is no reason that an omnipotent, omniscient, and holy good being would have for permitting great evil. And you'll recall this is a type of no see inference. The idea is, because I can't see a thing, it must not be there. And we looked at, and there are many cases where such inferences are just and valid to use. Daniel Speak, for instance, gave the example that if I see my son in the backyard eating dirt, and I think to myself, can I imagine any good reason why my son is eating dirt and I can't find one, that gives me good reason to think there is no such good justification that my son could have for eating dirt. So that's the idea. Now, I said that sometimes no seem inferences like this are just and good and valid, but not always. And in fact, we're going to look at two different ways in which a the theist might respond to Rose inference. And you'll recall from our very first video that this is going to match up to the two general responses that are given to the problem of evil, theodicy and defense. And you'll remember that theodicy claims that here is a plausible reason that God could have or would justify God in, um, in permitting evil to occur. But if you're merely giving a defense, you're just saying, look, we're not really in a position to think that God has no good reason for permitting evil. So theodicy is stronger. It's a more difficult or challenging case for the theist. You actually have to come up with some concrete reason that God would have for, um, to justify permitting evil. Defense is a little weaker. You're not saying that you know or can even understand what the reasons God would have for permitting evil are. You're simply saying that we're not in a position to claim that God could not have any good reason. Now, before we look at some specific types of theodicy, I just want to say a few things about theodicy in general. So, Speak here explains the idea behind what a theodicy is supposed to do, and he says, what a theodicy does is it seeks to show what God's morally sufficient reasons for permitting evil might very well be. That is what they reasonably can be thought to be. So, the idea behind a theodicy is you say, here are some plausible reasons God could have in mind for permitting evil. Now, of course, there is a further question here. You might ask, well, are those actually the reasons that God has? And here Speak um, urges us to have caution and humility. He says, who has the hubris to insist that he is in a position to ascertain God's actual reasons? You know, the idea is it would be ridiculous to say you can actually read the mind of God or actually know why it is that God permits evil. So when, the, when a person offers a theodicy, they're not necessarily saying this, these are the reasons God actually has in mind. They're just saying these are reasons that could 
um, plausibly justify God in permitting evil. Maybe God has other reasons, and that may be something we can't know. But if we can at least show that there are plausible reasons that would justify God in permitting evil, then Rose's inference falls apart, because we can actually see some good reasons God would have for allowing and permitting certain horrible tragedies to occur. Now, whenever you're evaluating theodicy, um, there's really two questions to keep in mind. And what I mean by evaluating a theodicy is just whenever you're thinking about, is this theodicy a good explanation of why God permits evil? And these two questions are the following, what I'll call the value question and the other means question. So every theodicy says, look, the reason God allows evil is to secure some specific really good thing. So the first question to ask, well, how valuable is that really good thing? Is that good thing that God is securing by allowing evil to happen, is it good enough to justify the extent of tragedy and suffering and horrible occurrences that we see in this world? So the idea is it can't just be a good thing. It must be a very good thing, a supremely important thing, given all the suffering that human beings endure. And the second question to keep in mind when thinking about these theodicies is the other means question. So the idea is in order to get that good thing, which the theodicy says that God is attempting to secure by allowing evil, you might ask, is it actually necessary to permit the amount of evil that we see? The idea is, could that good thing have, got, uh, have been gotten some other way? By not allowing certain evils to occur? By not allowing those evils to be as intense? By allowing less, uh, a lesser amount of evil? The other means question just asks, to get this good thing that the theodicy puts forth, could God have gotten it in some other way? Now at this point, those questions probably seem somewhat abstract. Um, so it would be easiest if we keep them in mind as we apply them to specific examples. And to do this, the first kind of theodicy that we're going to look at is what is called, known as the free will theodicy. And it's probably one that to some extent you've encountered or already thought of. The idea is, well, yes, people do horrible things. And one of Rowe's examples, um, there was a small girl who suffered just an unspeakable act of evil. And you might say, well, this isn't God's fault. This is just sort of a consequence of the fact that human beings have free will. And one philosopher who, you know, put this forth at a very early stage was uh, the theologian uh, Gregory of Nyssa. And he emphasized how God must, there, God has good reasons to give us free will, and this free will, inevita- free will inevitably will lead to cases where it's used incorrectly and where great uh, tragedies and very evil acts occur. So Gregory says um, that God would never have deprived us of the noblest and most precious of goods, I mean the gift of freedom and self-determination. For if necessity in any way ruled the life of man, the image of God would have been falsified in that particular. So remember when we talked about the idea of free will, we said one topic that free will touches on is a religious topic in the idea that, um, you know, in the Bible it said that man is made in the image of God. And Gregory says that freedom is the noblest and most precious of goods because it's only in virtue of freedom that we can be said to be a reflection or image of God. It's the one way in which we are pulled out of the sort of physical universe that we're not just like other natural beings and we participate to some extent in the divine essence. And so, first of all, what he's making a claim that answers the value question. What Nisa is saying is that freedom and self-determination are the noblest and most precious of goods. And that means, look, if they really are the noblest goods, the most precious goods, then maybe a lot of evil will have to result in order for us to have that noble good. Maybe God will have to let us do horrible and unspeakable tragedies if having free will really is that important. So we see him addressing the value question here. And he also... um, he notes that there will be certain consequences of this very high value. So again, he says, It is not God who is responsible for the present evils, since he has constituted your nature so as to be uncontrolled and free. The responsibilities with the perverse will which has chosen the worse instead of the better. So again, the free will 
Theodicy says the fault is not with God, the fault is with human beings for using their free will improperly. Now, one thing I also want to hi- highlight here, because it touches on this other means question, notice that Nisa says, in order for us to have free will, God had to make us uncontrolled and free. So one question we might have here is, well, is there any way that God could have secured the good of free will without giving us just complete free and total reign, without making us uncontrolled? Would it have been possible for God to place certain limits on us, which stop us maybe from doing the most horrible things, but still allow us to be free in the vast majority of cases? You might draw a comparison with governments here, right? So, um, governments in many countries allow their citizens a wide latitude of freedom to determine how they live their lives. But they don't give them complete freedom. They make it against the law to murder and steal and do all other sorts of crimes. So why couldn't God give us a sort of freedom that lets us choose many things, but maybe not the worst sort of crimes? So, we see that Nisa's explanation, or or, uh, Gregory of Nisa's explanation here, touches both on the value question and the other means question. He says both that free will is extremely valuable, and he also says that the goods of free will could not have been uh, afforded to us if we weren't essentially uncontrolled. So, to sum up, I have this summary of what the free will theodicy entails. The reason why God must permit certain kinds of evil, namely moral evils, is that in order to prevent moral evil, God would have had to take away the free will of human beings, but free will is a vital good, therefore God has good reason for permitting moral evil. Now one thing you'll notice about this summary is I talk about the concept of moral evil. What do I mean by this? So in discussions of the problem of evil, it's common to distinguish between moral evil and natural evil. So moral evil is an evil that comes from the intentional acts of persons or human beings, like murder, theft, lying, deception. It's just evil acts, bad acts that other people do. But there's also natural evils. These are evils that don't result from the intentional actions of anyone. Things like hurricanes and and earthquakes um, that cause great death and destruction, the fact that people are born or develop debilitating diseases that cause suffering and early death. No one in in general is, you know, intentionally at fault for these things. They're just natural occurrences, and we call these natural evils. So the first point I want to make is that whatever the power the free will theodicy has, it really only can say anything about moral evil and will necessarily leave natural evil untouched. But... This may not be overall um, a huge problem for the, for the theist, because as we'll see, there are other kinds of theodicies which can provide an account for natural evil. So for the moment, let's leave natural evil aside, and we'll focus specifically on moral evil and think about whether the free will theodicy can provide a response. To evaluate the free will theodicy, then, The first question we need to ask is the value question. Just how valuable is free will? And here we can point to a number of values that free will has that will be familiar from our previous discussion on free will and determinism. So for instance, Speak emphasizes that free will has value for our personhood. He says it does seem intrinsically good for creatures to be able to deliberate about courses of action and to be able to direct their own wills on the basis of this deliberation. In fact, it's often seen that free will is just part of what it means to be a person, part of what separates us from other animals, and part of what constitutes our human dignity, and also part of what makes it the case that we deserve a sort of special treatment and certain moral rights. So, free will seems to have a certain sort of value for our status as a person. In addition, it has, in a related way, an important moral value. As we discussed before, many philosophers will argue that if we don't have free will, we can't be held morally responsible for anything that we do. And if that's important to be able to hold people responsible for what they do, both in a good and bad sense, to praise them and blame them, then that would be lost without free will. So that's another benefit of free will that God might have in mind when saying, well, I know that giving free will to human beings will cause death, destruction, suffering, and agony, but this is a very important good uh, for these reasons of personhood and also the moral value of free will. Finally, as we've seen already, free will has a sort of theological value in that um, free will 
constitutes a special kind of relationship that could occur between God and creatures only if the creatures enter into the relationship of their own free will. So on the one hand, free will has the theological value of allowing us to be said to be created in the image of God. But also, if you think it's important that human beings can enter into a sort of relationship with God, maybe a relationship of love, then you might say, well, how could a relationship of true love and devotion and piety arise if it wasn't freely chosen? But if human beings don't have free will, we could never make those sort of free choices, and therefore our relationship with God would necessarily be downgraded. So those who push the free will theodicy will point to all these benefits and say, this is why it's important that God gives us free will, even though he knows that human beings will inevitably use their free will poorly. Now, to be balanced and fair here, we should, of course, consider, well, are there actually any downsides to free will? And in fact, we have been, um, you know, largely focused in our discussion of free will on the sort of threat or the danger of what if human beings don't have free will? And seeing this as a very negative thing, and then, you, you know, you see the compatibilists trying to save the idea that we have free will um, any way they can. But some philosophers have actually said, you know what, we don't have free will, and that's actually a good thing. For instance, one philosopher, Derek Paraboom, um, he famously argues recently that there are a lot of benefits to recognizing and living up to the fact that we don't have free will and living without free will. So, in, and this is Paraboom talking, he cites some philosophers in the Stoic tradition who have argued that determinism allows for an increased degree of equanimity in the face of bad things that happen. So what's equanimity? Just sort of mental calmness, tranquility, a lack of disturbance. The idea here is that if determinism is true, then everything that happens can ultimately be attributed to something encompassing. God, perhaps, or something more impersonal, such as the nature of the universe. So if, if human beings don't have free will, and determinism is true, and, and our actions we take are simply the product of past causation, or the will of God, or the structure of the universe, or whatever it is, then when things go wrong in your life, when things happen that are tragedies, when you, uh, your desires go unsatisfied, when you don't feel you're living up to who you should be, the responsibility ultimately isn't on you. And when you see yourself as the locus of freedom and responsibility, when things don't go your way, it's easy to blame yourself, it's easy to be resentful, it's easy to even be anxious and depressed. It's very easy to lose that sense of, of mental uh, 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 equanimity, and it's very easy to experience a real sense of mental disturbance. But on the other hand, if determinism is true, if we don't have free will, then you can say, look, whatever happens in the universe is not up to me. It's not within my control. It's within the control of God, the laws of nature, the structure of the universe, fate, whatever it may be. And as Paraboom um, explains, by psychological identification with this entity that's in control, perhaps by taking on its perspective, one can achieve a sort of acceptance of whatever happens. But libertarian freedom would rule out this route to equanimity, because if human beings have freedom of this type, their free decisions cannot be attributed to this encompassing entity. So, it's worth noting on the other side, we might really wonder, if God gave us free will, did God do us a favor in, in fact, doing that? Or did God just give us a greater ability to um, feel disturbed, feel anxious, feel depressed, feel resentful, to ultimately feel unsatisfied, and feel responsible for our own dis dissatisfaction when things do not go our way? So the main point here to see is that the case for whether free will is valuable enough is often going to depend on how important do you think it is to be fundamentally in control of your life, how important uh, do you think it is to be able to take responsibility for the things you do, or would we have been better off to be in a situation where we could just fundamentally accept what happens and not see everything that happens as sort of a product of our own decision making and our own responsibility. However, when evaluating the free will theodicy, we should keep in mind that there are two questions in play. 
There is the value question, which we just discussed, but remember there's also the other means question. Even if free will truly is valuable for human beings, we can still ask, could God have gotten that value without allowing so much suffering by some other means? And in order to evaluate this question, let's consider the following sort of structure of our actions and the results our actions produce. And the question I want to consider here is what is required for us to perform a free action? So whenever you perform an action, um, whether it's a, a rather mundane action or not, doesn't matter what it is, there's a couple of components. First, there's your intention, there's your motive, there your, there's the goal that you're trying to accomplish. Then there's the actual action that you perform. There's the movement of your body, which constitutes the action. And finally, those two things come together to produce some outcome. So you intend to cause X, you, you act so as to bring X about, and then X occurs or it doesn't. Now the question I'm, I'm concerned with here is, is it possible for us to be free if we only have one and two, but we do not have three? That is, can we be free if we're free to intend to bring X about, and we're allowed to act so as to cause X, but X just doesn't occur? And to see why this would be an issue, I'm going to compare the following two cases. So let's look at case A, which we'll call job failure. Ryan wants to land a desirable job opportunity. He gets an interview and works hard preparing for the interview. The interview goes well, but unfortunately for Ryan, another candidate performs better. Thus, Ryan does not get the job. Now, I want to reflect on this case a little bit and apply it to the structure we just looked at. Now, what happened in this situation? Well, Ryan intended to get the job, so you can check that off. Ryan acted to get the job. He went to the interview. He prepared for the interview. Um, he talked with the person at the interview, etc. But ultimately, the outcome he was intending and acting to cause did not come about. X did not occur. He did not get the job. Now, so you ask yourself, well, is Ryan free in this instance? And I think most people would say yes. Yeah, I mean... Ryan, things didn't work out the way Ryan wanted to, and maybe that's unfortunate, but he still had free will here. It's not like just because what he didn't want to happen to undermined his free will. Okay, so that seems like a pretty intuitive, probably common uh, response here. So let's compare that to case B, and I'll call this prevented attempted murder. Ryan wants to kill his mortal enemy, Jeff. Ryan lays the appropriate plans, procures a murder weapon, and chooses an appropriate time to commit the act. Ryan pulls the trigger, firing his gun at Jeff, but divine intervention causes the bullet to miss Jeff. Perhaps the bullet gets blown off course by a sudden and extremely strong gust of wind. Now, at first glance, this seems like a case that's very similar to A. Ryan intended to bring about the death of Jeff, he acted so as to bring about Jeff's death by pulling the trigger on the gun. But the only thing that didn't happen is that Jeff didn't die, in this case because of some sort of divine intervention that caused a very strong gust of wind to blow the bullet off course. Now you might be able to see where I'm going here. In case A, Ryan intended and acted but didn't get what he wanted, we said Ryan's still free. In case B, Ryan intended and acted but didn't get what he wanted, so can we say that Ryan is still free in that case? And it's important to see why this matters. If we can say that all you need for free action is to be able to intend what you want and act to get what you want, but not necessarily actually achieve the occurrence you're uh, trying to accomplish, then it seems that God could prevent all sorts of evil without actually undermining our free will. God could allow people to intend to rob banks and act to rob banks, but prevent it at the last moment, and they would still be free. God could allow people to intend to lie to others and act so as to lie to others, but prevent the lie somehow, or prevent the consequences of the lie without undermining free will. God could prevent murder in just the way I've described, without undermining free will. So the point here is that if we think Ryan is still free in case B, then we really have to ask that other means question and we have to say, could God eliminate all sorts of evil and still allow human beings free will? Could God secure whatever goods are involved with free will, but 
not have to undergo this cost or sacrifice of the suffering that we commonly see. Now, one point I would make here is that in, you know, we should really think about are there differences between these cases. And I think one way to get started there would be to simply say that if you look at case A, one I think relevant difference here is that Ryan doesn't have the same expectation of getting the job. When you go to a job interview, you know that you might get the job or you might not get the job, and you can't be in a position where you say, well, me intending and acting to get the job has a very high likelihood of me getting it. You know there are other candidates. But when you're attempting murder, for instance, um, and you intend to kill someone and you actually go through the action that's uh, supposed to cause the murder, you know there's a very high likelihood that it will happen, at least in the case that's described, where, someone, where Ryan is literally pulling the trigger at a gun aimed at Jeff. And so we might say here, well, one of the big differences between the two cases is that in the one, Ryan doesn't really have an expectation that his outcome will necessarily occur, but in case B, he does have that expectation. And maybe that's important. And in fact, those who um, respond to the problem of evil with a theodicy will really stress the idea that there is a value to stable, fixed, and coherent laws of nature. So Speak explains this point. He says, without fixed and coherent laws of nature, the kinds of moral action that's, that soul-making requires would be impossible. If you're going to save someone from drowning, for example, the laws of nature will have to be regular and predictable. In order for there to be danger, in order for you to recognize the danger, in order for you to execute your rescue plan. So the point is God could constantly intervene in our actions to stop the consequences of them at the last minute, make bullets swerve um, at the last second. Someone's trying to stab another person and also the, the, the knife dissolves in their hand, right? These are all things God presumably could do. But it would come at the cost of constantly intervening into the world and undermining the stable natural laws. And if we don't have confidence that there are these stable natural laws, how can we predict the consequences of our actions? How can we know what our actions are going to bring about? And if we can't know what our actions are going to bring about, how can we in fact um, act not only freely, but also act in a moral way? Speak continues to explain, the appeal to the value of stable natural laws provides for at least an initially plausible response to the question why God doesn't alleviate a great deal of suffering by way of saving miracles. We cannot leverage our decisions into compassionate and courageous help if regular divine interventions veil not just the danger, but the efficacy of our wills. So the usual response here is that, um, no, freedom doesn't always require that the occurrence you're trying to bring about occurs, but it does require that there are certain natural laws in place such that you know if someone is drowning um, that they're going to need to be saved and that there's certain consequences of you jumping in the river. It requires you knowing that when you pull the trigger on the gun, there are certain predictable consequences that will come about. And if the world was such that God was constantly intervening, we could not have that predictability on the, our actions, if we couldn't have that predictability in our actions, we could not act freely, and therefore we would not have free will. So at this point, the person who is pressing the problem of evil might say, well, look, even if free will can explain um, many evils, right? Even if free will can explain why human beings perform horrendous actions, we're still left with this question of natural evil. Why do so many, many people suffer from her, you know, the damage caused by hurricanes and tornadoes and earthquakes and just diseases that seem to strike people randomly and unfairly? What's the explanation for all the suffering that isn't caused by human beings? And here we're going to be relying on the work of a philosopher named John Hick who developed what um, he called the soul-making theodicy. And in order to understand the soul-making theodicy and the role that um, not just moral evil, but also natural evil plays in making the world a more perfect place, we need to distinguish between two questions. So we're asking, what makes the world more or less perfect? Well, on the one hand, we might say, we would know a perfect world by asking, does human existence have enough pleasure to be permitted by a maximally loving being? 
So when you're looking out in the world and asking yourself, is this world a perfect place? Does it look governed by an all-perfect being? You might expect to see, or you might say, what I'm looking for is an extremely pleasurable world, a world where many people are happy. In fact, where maybe everyone is happy to a maximal degree. So that's one question you might ask. And certainly, it would be hard to point to a perfect world which didn't have some amount of happiness, in which happiness was irrelevant. But the key to the soul-making theodicy is that there's actually a more fundamental question. And that question is, is the world as we find it a reasonable moral training ground? Those who push the soul-making theodicy say, look, the primary purpose of our existence here isn't to be happy, or it's not fundamentally just to feel pleasure, but it's to develop ourselves. To develop ourselves as moral, ethical, and even courageous beings in the face of very bad things that happen. And John Hick argues that this second standard is the standard we should use to judge the perfection of the world. He says, men are not to be thought of on the analogy of animal pets, whose life is to be made as agreeable as possible, but rather on the analogy of human children, who are to grow to adulthood in an environment whose primary and overriding purpose is not immediate pleasure, but the realizing of the most valuable potentialities of human personality. So this gives you the contours of what is known as the soul-making theodicy. That yes, there is horrible tragedy, both moral and natural evil in our world, but its positive purpose, the reason it makes the world a more perfect place, is that it gives us the opportunity to perfect ourselves. It gives us the opportunity, the opportunity to develop our specifically human capacities. And so I think one way to explain this soul-making theodicy is with the following argument, which I'll call the argument from soul-making. So P1, some world can only be the best possible world if it provides the opportunity for soul-making. P2, a world can only provide the opportunity for soul-making if that world contains a substantial amount of undistributed evil. So a world can only be the best possible world if it contains, again, a substantial amount of unevenly distributed evil. And before we look at the details of how Hicks supports the premises, we should really keep in mind these two questions, because the point of the soul-making theodicy isn't just to say the world needs evil, but it has to justify the claim that, one, there must be a lot of evil. So much evil that it would make someone like Roe um, to all appearances, think that there must be gratuitous or pointless evils. And not only must there be a lot of evil, but it must be unevenly distributed. Some people must live great and happy lives, while other people just seem to not have any good luck. They suffer horrible diseases, they have family tragedies, um, they experience economic hardship. And if we look around the world, it's not difficult to see that this is the case. Some people really do live in destitute poverty with no opportunity, while other people live very nice lives, and it seems unfairly and unevenly distributed. So we'll also need an answer to the question, why is that? What is the positive role played by each of these aspects of the conclusion? So let's begin examining this argument by looking at the first premise which again says that a world can only be the best possible world if it provides the opportunity for soul-making or this process of development. So how does Hick dis, um, explain this point? He says that when we think about the purpose of human life, it's, as he describes it, God's con there's a God's continuing creative purpose for man. Hick explains that man has been made as a person in the image of God, but has not yet been brought as a free and responsible agent into the finite likeness of God. Our world, with all its rough edges, is the sphere in which the second and harder stage of the creative process is taking place. So Hick says, well, the idea is that first, we are created as a human being capable of free will in the image of God, but we only achieve our true and full development in the highest spiritual and moral and ethical sense when we finally develop ourselves as persons and develop all of our capacities. And we can only do that in a world that, as he explains, has these rough edges. Okay, so I think we can see the idea here. We certainly don't think that our lives should just be full of pleasure. We do, of course, 
think that we ought to be developing ourselves and developing our courage, our fortitude, our honesty and generosity. That does make sense. But again, probably the more controversial claim is the second one. Why do we need so much evil? Why must it be unevenly distributed? Well, first, Hick explains that, look, if we, if we really lived in a sort of paradise world, there would be far-reaching consequences. So Hick says, for example, no one could ever injure anyone else. The murderer's knife would turn to paper or his bullets to thin air. The bank safe robbed of a million dollars would miraculously become filled with another million dollars. Fraud, deceit, conspiracy, and treason would somehow always leave the fabric of society undamaged. In fact, if we really think about a world like that, where you really were where God never permitted us to actually harm another person, it would be a world with no true danger, with no true lack. And if there were no true danger, if there were no true harm, if there were no respects in which we were lacking, then we would never be called upon to really develop ourselves to meet those challenges. Hick explains, there would be no call to be concerned for others in time of need or danger, for in such a world there would be no real needs or dangers. And he says, one can at least begin to imagine such a world, and it's evident that our present ethical concepts would have no meaning in it. Now, what does this mean? Well, if there was no um, poverty, what use would generosity have? If there was no danger, what use would courage have? If we were never tempted by things we shouldn't do, what use would a virtue like temperance have? If we were never um, vulnerable to making bad decisions, why have a virtue like prudence, the ability to use our reason and capacity well? The point is, without imperfection, without challenges, without danger, we can never develop as moral beings. So the first claim Hick wants to make is that, in fact, we do need danger, we do need evil, we do need challenges to overcome. But of course, again, we have to wonder why so much, why so evenly distributed. And Hick does acknowledge that this is the case. He says, sometimes the contrary happens, and instead of ennobling, um, affliction crushes the soul and wrests from it whatever virtues it possessed. The overall situation is thus that so far as we can tell, suffering occurs haphazardly, uselessly, and therefore unjustly. Pain and misery seem to fall upon men patternlessly and meaninglessly. And meaninglessly. So when we think about again that some people are just in destitute poverty, suffering, and very, it seems from our point of view, unjustly in comparison to those who live happy lives, we might wonder, well, in what sense can those individuals be said to um, have the opportunity for soul building if they have no real opportunity in their lives in the first place, no opportunity to develop? And why is it fair that those individuals suffered so much more than other individuals who didn't seem to have to be called on? Um, to be called on upon to develop their moral capacities. So the point just is that Hick recognizes this problem. And of course, the problem goes even deeper than just the uneven suffering of human beings. So there's a famous passage by Charles Darwin, um, who used, he used a, sur a similar sort of idea to argue against the existence of God from evil. So Darwin said in his autobiography, some have attempted to explain this in reference to man by imagining that it serves for his moral improvement. But the number of men in the world is no as nothing compared with that of all other sentient beings, and these often suffer greatly without any moral improvement. What advantage can there be in the sufferings of millions of the lower animals throughout almost endless time? So what does Darwin emphasize here? Even if we abstract away from human suffering, think about all the suffering in the animal world. Think about all the suffering that animals undergo now on a daily basis. Think about Rose, a hypothetical but realistic case of a fawn um, burning to death for, for three days before finally dying. Think about the time before human beings evolved when for millions of years animals were, were suffering. According to the soul-making theodicy, the point of suffering is to provide an opportunity to overcome challenges. And even if we say that it's not really fair that some people have so many more challenges than others, how is that possible for beings like animals that don't really have a true moral character to develop? If they don't have a true moral character to develop, then this, again, seems like a case where they're just suffering that is gratuitous and pointless and doesn't serve a purpose.
Now, in order to respond here, what Hick needs is some reason, some justifying reason why it's important that there's actually not just a lot of evil, but haphazard and unevenly distributed evil. And one of the main reasons he gives is the following. In such a world, human misery would not evoke deep personal sympathy or call forth organized relief or sacrificial help and service. For it is presupposed in these compassionate reactions both that the suffering is not deserved and that it is bad for the sufferer. So think about a time when you've personally felt a need to help another person, or when you felt great sympathy for someone else, or when you wanted to make a personal sacrifice for another person. You probably wouldn't have done that if you thought they deserved what they were getting, right? When you hear about people in destitute poverty, if you really thought, oh, well, they deserve this, you would never be um, moved to help. Also, if you didn't think that this was bad for them, you also wouldn't be moved to help because there's no need to ameliorate or help a situation that isn't bad. So the, the point he makes is that if we didn't live in a world that was, in some, to some extent, unequal, where some people live very nice lives and other people suffer seemingly unjustly, there would never be an opportunity to cha- for um, people to be challenged to sa- make sacrifices and to show a deep care, concern, and sympathy for other members of the human species. He continues on, It seems then that in a world that is to be the scene of compassionate love and self-giving for others, suffering must fall upon mankind with something of the haphazardness and inequity that we now experience. It must be apparently unmerited, pointless, and incapable of being rationalized. For it is precisely this feature of our common human lot that creates sympathy between man and man and evokes the unselfishness, kindness, and goodwill which are among the highest values of personal life. So if you think deep human sympathy, compassion, and care, and concern, and self-sacrifice on behalf of others are important, then he says not only should we be glad we live in a world with so much evil, or at least not only is it a good thing we live in a world with so much evil, but it's necessary that the evil in the world is not fairly distributed, that it seems uh, to fall uh, randomly upon people, that people who don't deserve it have bad things happen to them. And so given this, what Hick concludes is that it would seem then that an environment intended to make possible the growth in free beings of the finest characteristics of personal life must have a good deal in common with our present world. If we think it's important that God provide an opportunity for human beings to develop themselves as courageous, prudent, temperate, generous, honest, and self-sacrificial beings who care about the well-being of others, then we should expect the world would look basically like it does, with a lot of evil, with a lot of tragedy and suffering, but also a lot of opportunity for us to respond in creative and productive and sympathetic and compassionate ways. I think there's a lot to be said for this argument, but I think the main question may boil down to this. Is there a sense of unfairness still in Hick's account? Even if it's true that unmerited suffering does give other people the opportunity to to show sympathy and compassion. Is that sympathy and compassion important enough? Is it just fundamentally unjust that some people must live horrible lives Mm -hmm. to justify or give the opportunity for other people to show that sympathy and concern? I'll be very interested to hear what your thoughts are on that point. For now, I will cut the video here, and I will see you next time.